Dan's an idiot. <laughs> Ollie's grumpy. Nicky's cute. <laughs> Mike's bad. Yeah. <laughs> and Kirby's a clown. They are the guinea pigs, five of the most stupid people in the universe. And this is Professor Stuart Milligan. Now that's practical science. One of the cleverest. Imagine you a cow. And he's going to push the boys physically and mentally to the absolute limits of stupidity, all in the pursuit of science. Hooray for science! <laughs> Coming up on tonight's show, cold bits. Mine are like a couple of little grapes. <laughs> Horsepower v pig power, we reveal what these headache tablets, Dan and NASA technology have in common. <laughs> Plus, vegetarians look away because Daisy could be for the chop as the pigs attempt to eat their way into the record books. I'm eating the inside of Daisy. Mm. No doubt, as children, we were all told at one time or another to stop pulling funny faces in case the wind changed and our faces stayed like that. But is there any truth to it? The guinea pigs are about to find out. <laughs> to discover if the wind can change your face, we need a lot of wind. And not the Dan kind. Shea Pig isn't in the tornado belt, so we're replacing wind pressure with rubber. The pigs will place the bungee cord under their noses. They'll then make their way down this line of marshmallows. Whoever gets the furthest wins. This really is a three pig race. Nicky is too short. I'm too short for this. <laughs> and Kirby's just useless. <laughs> so who do you think will eat the most marshmallows? Chunky Ollie? Have a look. Okay, that's... Greedy Dan. <laughs> or Mad Mike. Three, two, one. Go! Now remember kids, the guinea pigs are doing this because we have persuaded them that their pain is in the interest of the greater good. So don't try anything like this at home. So how is it that the boys can put themselves under this kind of duress, yet their faces always return to their normal shape? It's all to do with the protein fibres in the skin. Collagen gives it its strength and structure, and elastin allows it to be stretched and rebound. This allows our skin to stretch as we move, and our faces to contort to make all kinds of funny expressions. God, God! Oh. As we all know by now, when Dan decides he wants something, nothing will get in his way. And despite his best efforts to the contrary, he just can't turn his nose up to a free lunch. <laughs> well done, Dan. That was exactly as we planned it. <laughs> now, Mike is quite tall, but fairly slight. <laughs> By rights, he shouldn't be able to stretch the elastic as far as Ollie. But you have to remember the competitive nature of these highly trained athletes who can't stand to lose. <laughs> and Mike's grit wins the day. So the wind won't change your face because skin is just like rubber and very elastic. Of course, we all knew that, but it was worth it for the laugh. Go on, Mike! Come on. <laughs> a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. 
That was Shakespeare's Richard III, illustrating in one succinct line the huge role the horse has played in the history of man. From battlefield to farm, from derby winners to dog dinners, throughout the ages, the horse has been there. If I was to say horsepower to you, you'd probably think of this. And this. But what exactly does horsepower mean? And how does it relate to this thing called torque? And if horsepower is so good, is guinea pig power even better? To find out, we sent the guinea pigs straight to the horse's mouth. This is Sunnycroft Farm in lovely Surrey. And these are Cos and Titan. As you can see, they're horses. To help explain horsepower, the guinea pigs have challenged Cos and Titan to a race and a game of tug of war. Did you know that in Korea in 1997, two men had their left arms ripped off during a tug of war involving 1,500 people? But first, we need to find out what all this talk about torque is all about. Torque is the force that gets something moving. For example, it requires very little torque for me to push this tiny baby here. Gucci, gucci, gucci. Pushing this old goat-ridden sea dog, however, requires a lot more torque. Oh, God. Now, let's see what we've learnt being applied in a game of tug-of-war. Can the guinea pigs generate enough torque to move the horses back across the line? Tactics. We've got our pulling gloves, 10 to be precise. They've got no pulling gloves. Obviously, we're going to be doing the pulling technique, not the pushing technique. I think that's easy enough. Oh, whipping girl's here to help as well. <laughs> All we need now is dramatic music. Horses, are you ready? Guinea pigs, are you ready? Yeah! Take strain. Uh, Heat! Go, guys! Ow. Go, 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 go! Heat! Come on! Horses, go! <laughs> Horses cheated. Clearly. Yeah, Clearly totally cheating right. going on here. Well, that was rubbish. Bad pigs. Oh, he's off to us, Bill. I knew there was a reward in this. <laughs> well, that's talk dealt with. What about horsepower? Horsepower was defined back in the 18th century as the amount of power needed for a horse to pull. 330 pounds of coal up a 100-foot shaft in just one minute. And for those of you living in France, that would be 150 kilos up 30 metres in une minute. To illustrate horsepower, the pigs are going to race Titan and Cos over a 50-metre course. Ollie will be in the driving seat, so to give the boys a fighting chance, they'll be pulling a buggy half the weight of the horses. Remember, torque gets the object moving, horsepower keeps it moving. Does this mean they've generated more power than the horses? Well, no, of course not. The boys had a smaller load and didn't have to apply as much torque, so they got to full speed quicker. In fact, take a look at that race again. The horses aren't even running. Let's not tell the boys that, though. Today, Dan is going to go where no man would ever want to go he's going to experience an awful build-up of gas. But for once, the gas won't come from Dan himself. We're going to show you how NASA launch rockets. These film canisters will be the rockets, these fizzy headache tablets will be the fuel, and Dan's man bits will be the moon. Houston, prepare for liftoff. What we're looking at here is Newton's third law in action. As I'm sure you all know, Newton's third law states for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This is the action. The pigs place the headache tablets in the film canister with warm water. 
the tablets start to dissolve and create a build-up of gas. This action continues until enough pressure builds up to blow apart the canister from its lid. The reaction is the launch of the rocket. And it's only going the one way. <laughs> Let me take you through the bullet points of that again. Here's the action, and here's the reaction. <laughs> action, reaction. Action, reaction. Action, reaction. <laughs> Houston, we have the takeoff. Yay! It looks much worse than it is. The empty plastic container is actually very light and so has very little momentum, so there's no risk of any damage. But testes are delicate and they aren't built for silly shenanigans. So remember, just like your teeth, if you take care of them, they'll take care of you. Hooray for science! <laughs> This is Below Zero, a bar made of ice in sunny London town. Yes, they can take away our budget, they can even take the pig's clothes away, but they can't take our determination to find out why being in the cold makes you want to wee. As well as looking at the effect of cold temperatures on urine production, we're also going to find out if fat really helps you stay warm. Ollie and Mike are polar opposites in body mass and shape, which makes them perfect candidates for this study. Unfortunately, this means finding out what their core temperatures are. Yes, it's not very pleasant, but sticking a thermometer up the boy's bottoms is a far more effective way of gauging body temperature than placing it anywhere on the body's surface. That's why it's called core temperature. Now on to the experiment. We'll see how long the boys hold off visiting the wee boys' room in a cold environment. Let's get going. And to encourage nature to take its course, the boys will drink a glass of juice every two minutes. It's a little bit cold. <laughs> it may take some time for nature to take its course, but the boys are already having their first reactions to the cold, shrinking bits. Yeah, mine feel the same because I used it to warm up my hands. Mine have only slightly shrunk. Mine are like a couple of little grapes. <laughs> <laughs> mine are as small as they get. <laughs> as I'm sure any male of the species will tell you, one of the more bizarre effects of the cold is that the testes tend to shrivel up and get very small. When this happens, the muscles in the scrotum contract to pull the testes up and close to the body. Ooh. Curiously enough, professional sumo wrestlers are trained to attract their Hello. testicles back into their abdomens, so they aren't damaged when wrestling. Come on, Nicky! Shiver my timbers! Look at Nicky's hands! Jump, <laughs> Turn down the heating, turn down the heating. <laughs> 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 Raise the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm filling the needs. Nicky needs a pee. Nicky needs a pee. 40 minutes in and the entire supply of juice has been drunk and the boys start to obey the call of nature, much quicker than if they were at room temperature. We all knew we go. Real guinea pigs don't need weeds. <laughs> <laughs> really, really badly. So why does the cold make you pee? It's fascinating, really. The cold causes a reduction in blood flow to the surface of the skin. But the blood has got to go somewhere. So the blood volume deep inside increases and puts up blood pressure. The body's response is to try and reduce the pressure by getting your kidneys to get rid of more water. Therefore, cold makes you pee. Oh, they need to wee. Oh, they need a wee. Oh, they need a wee. At the end of the first hour, Ollie succumbs to the call of the loo. 
But Mike and Kirby look like they're having fun. But for how long? Just the hardcore pigs! Hey! Just the hardcore pigs! Hey! Just the hardcore pigs! It was then decided that Kirby and Mike were not going to go to the toilet anytime soon. And for health and safety reasons, the experiment needed to wind up. Truly, this is one of the most stupid things I have ever seen. <laughs> That's right. To decide who was the winner, the pigs are playing slaps. So much for scientific integrity. Mike is the winner, but there's still the other part of the experiment left to conclude. Minus 37.6. 37.7. So, what's happened to the boys' core temperatures? Well, regardless of how fat they were, both the boys' bodies have been so efficient in reducing heat loss that their core temperatures haven't changed, allowing them to keep their vital organs and brain nice and warm. We've also found out why the cold makes you pee, why you should never play with ice, and most importantly, never, never do this. <laughs> Lovely moo cows. Let's eat them. You could be forgiven for thinking that some of the guinea pigs have four stomachs each, but you'd be wrong. Daisy here, on the other hand, does. Why? In this experiment, we're going to delve into the science of one of the most remarkable food machines in the world. No, not Ollie. The cow. To help explain why a cow has four stomachs, the guinea pigs could have gone to an abattoir. But the professor has come up with a far more disgusting way to illustrate why Daisy needs more than one gut. This is tripe, cow intestines, and the pigs are going to attempt to set a world record for eating it. Today, tripe is often considered one of the most disgusting foodstuffs known to man because it's slimy and it smells like poo. How times have changed. Tripe used to be the staple food in Britain. People ate it all the time. As recently as 1900, there were 260 tripe shops in Manchester alone. Tons of the stuff were eaten. Today, there are only a few hardcore fans who now regard it as a delicacy. As do the French. I'll have that. Each guinea pig has been given two kilos of tripe. To set a new world record, the pigs must eat as much as possible in 12 minutes. Why would someone eat that? It looks foul. It looks foul. Oh my god. Don't like this. <laughs> Poor Nick. He looks like he'd rather eat his own elbows. But what has all this got to do with cows' stomachs? Imagine you're a cow. For breakfast, you can have grass. For lunch, grass. And dinner? Well, you see the point. And just to make sure you don't lose the taste in between meals, you're sick, back into your mouth. And you chew it all over again. It's called chewing the cud. Why? Well, grass is pretty hard to digest. To do this, the cow needs four stomachs to get the goodness out of the grass. The first three are really like a walking compost bin. 50 litres, full of bacteria and microorganisms, fermenting the indigestible grass. The guinea pigs are currently eating tripe, which comes from the first three stomachs. This is the fourth stomach, which is very much like our own. It's only after the journey through the first three that the grass remnants can finally be digested. And that's why a cow needs four stomachs. After five minutes of this tripe-eating world record attempt, the pig's vigorous mastication starts to take its toll. Oh, Nine minutes into the tripe scoffing record attempt and the pigs are falling like flies. Uh. 
I'm eating the inside of Daisy. If you can keep it down, Tripe has got lots to offer. A typical 90 gram serving packs in 13 grams of protein, but still only contains 85 calories. That's the same as a banana. Go on, do it. Do it. <laughs> With less than two minutes to go to set a record, all boys have given up, except Dan. Well done, Dan. Dan, very happy with his result there and with what he hopes is a new world record. There's only one problem. Due to a small error in communication, Dan's plate had been cleared before the officials could calculate how much tripe he had eaten. Dan Ibbotson, tripe-eating world record contender, wishing he had four stomachs, or at least one of Ollie's.